Hey guys, welcome to this tutorial. This is a beginner 3JS tutorial where I'm gonna be showing you how to build this procedurally generated galaxy. I came up with this method for generating this galaxy while I was working on my game AI Arena. It's a massive multiplayer coding game where you write your code in the browser and then submit it onto this giant galaxy server where everybody's code competes in a battle royale until there's only one player left. I'd really appreciate it if you guys would check that out. But anyways, let's get started. So the way that this project is set up is kind of uh, a blast from the past. It's just HTML importing a JavaScript module, um, some CSS for styling the 3JS canvas, and then we're gonna use import maps to bring in our 3JS. In our main file, we already have the uh, render pipeline set up, and I'll explain that later. You don't have to worry about setting up the camera controls or the scene or anything you can just clone my git repo and start from there or just copy the code directly. There's also a couple of config files in this shader file here that I will go into more detail what these are for later on in the video. Lastly, there's a couple of images that we're gonna use as textures. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. The first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is create a star. So we're gonna make a new file for that called star.js. We're going to import three and we're going to import something called bloom layer from the render config, which just tells uh, 3JS to render this object on the bloom layer. And I'll explain what that is later. Next, we're gonna use a texture loader to load in our texture. We wanna load in the uh, 120 pixel sprite. And then we are going to turn that into a material to apply to our sprite later on. We're gonna create a class called star. Um, instead of just attaching raw sprites to the scene graph. We wanna have some sort of object to keep track of them. There's multiple ways that you can do this, but this is just the way that I wanted to go about it. Each star object is going to take in some sort of position. And whenever we're creating the sprite later on, we will use that position to position the sprite. We're also going to create a method in here called two three object that will turn this star with its data into a three object and copy over the position and scale and attach it to the scene. Now, if we come back out here to main, we can create a new position, create a new star from that position, and then call 23 object and pass in the scene, and we should see our star get added to the scene. Okay, cool, this looks pretty good. And uh, since we already have the bloom rendering pipeline set up, we can see that our star looks like it's glowing, but it's a little bit large, so let's adjust the scale. Let's just cut down the scale by half and see what that looks like. Okay, it's smaller now. Now we wanna start making multiple stars. We could just start placing them randomly, but we're going to do what's called a Gaussian distribution. If you don't know what a Gaussian distribution is, it's just a bell curve. Basically, we want to have more stars towards the center and fewer stars towards the outskirts. So let's create a function called Gaussian random that does that. The parameters mean and stdev stand for mean and standard deviation. You can think of the mean as basically where we want the center of our star cluster to be and the standard deviation is how far spread out it is. I won't really talk about how the math works for this, but if you're interested, you can go look up the Gaussian distribution function on Wikipedia. Now we're just gonna do a for loop and use a Gaussian to create the XYZ values of our vector three and then create stars using that and it should place the stars in a three-dimensional Gaussian distribution. If you're interested, try playing around with the mean and standard deviation to see how the cluster changes. All right, cool. So this does look like a star cluster. Let's get rid of that grid, that's kind of annoying. Okay, cool. So we have a cluster of stars now. Uh, the problem is it's too spread out. If you'll take a look at galaxies, you'll see that they're actually more flat uh, along, I guess what we'd call the z-axis. So let's take care of that. So up here in our config folder, we're gonna create a file called galaxy config. And this is just going to hold all of the variables that control how our galaxy is shaped and drawn. The first thing we want is num stars. That's how many stars is gonna be in our galaxy. Next thing we want is galaxy thickness. Uh, this is just the standard deviation in the Z axis of the galaxy. And that's going to be the same for all the different parts of the galaxy. And we're gonna set that to five. Next is the core X and Y distribution. Um, this is just the standard deviation of the core. So galaxies all kind of have a core um, and we're just gonna start with that first. So now let's go back to our main function and let's set the mean to zero for all of these so that it's centered at the center. And we're gonna change it to core X dist, core Y dist, and the uh, galaxy thickness instead. Also, just to get a better picture, let's change the number of stars from 100 to 1000 and see how that looks. 
Okay, so this is looking better, but our stars are all kind of uh, white and homogenous. And if you look at images of actual galaxies, you'll see there's a lot of blues, there's a lot of yellows. It looks very different. So if you go to Wikipedia and look at the stellar classification page, they actually have a chart that shows the distribution of the different colors of stars. Um, blue stars are larger and hotter, yellow, red, and orange stars are smaller and cooler. Based on this distribution, I just created a small um, like JSON thing called star types. It has the percentage chance that a star, like the probability that a star will exist, the color, and the relative size of the star. So let's add that to our star object. So we want to have a different material for each one of our different star colors. The map will still be the same texture, but we're going to take our colors from that distributions object that we created earlier and use those to create an array of materials. Next, each star is going to have a star type. This is just going to be an index that indexes into the distribution, and we'll set that in a method called generate star type. The way that this function works, it generates a random number, and then it finds which bin of the distribution the random number lands in. So if there's a 70% chance that a star will be like a yellow dwarf or something, I don't remember the classification of the stars, then if the random number is less than 0.7, then it'll go into that bin. If it's between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8, it'll go into the next bin, so on and so forth. We also want to change our stars to be the same size that they are in the distribution. So here in Multiply Scalar, we're going to index into the star type size array and set our size equal to that. We also want to use our star type index to select which sprite material we are, so we're going to do that here. Okay, so now you see we have this much warmer, yellower distribution um, with the blues kind of being washed out and made to look white. But these stars are too large. When we zoom in all the way, these stars are way too big. So what we want to do is we want to actually shrink the stars as we zoom in and grow them as we zoom out because we want them to stay large so that they can take up more space and kind of grow together and glow as we zoom out. So back in star.js, we're going to add a method called update scale. What update scale does is it takes in a camera object and figures out how far away the star is from the camera and then uses that distance to resize it based on some function. Scale the distance by 250 just because that's a good value that I found through trial and error. And then we're going to update our star size and clamp it between the minimum and maximum star sizes. So that way we don't draw our stars too large or too small. Okay, so back in main, we want to keep track of all the stars that we create. So we're going to create an empty array called stars. And then as we create all of these stars, we're going to push them to the array. Now in the render function that runs every frame in main, we're going to loop through all those stars and update their scale by passing in the camera object. Okay, now when we go back to our scene, we'll see that our stars are much better proportioned. And as we zoom out, that galactic core actually seems to glow and get brighter, kind of like it would in a real galaxy. And then as we zoom in again, we see that things get dimmer and we can look at these stars up close again. Let's follow some good practices. Let's replace that uh, clamp function with an actual function called clamp that we can put in the utils folder. And let's also move our Gaussian random utility function out to the utils folder. All right, now it's time for the spiral arms. So go to the galaxy config. We're going to create some more constants here. Arm X and Y dist are the standard deviation of the arms in the X and Y axes. Arm X and Y mean are like where the arms are centered. Spiral is how strong we want the spiral force to be. And arms is the number of arms. So now we're going to create a new function in utils called spiral. This function is going to take in an x, y, z value, and then also an offset, which is just a rotational offset from zero. And based on the x, y distance, it's going to figure out the radius, and the further out something is from the center, it's going to be offset more. So you can think that like stuff in the center is spinning really fast, and it's not going to be as spiraled out as something at the end of the arm, which is like looping really, really far. Okay, so now come back out to main. Uh, we're going to do a nested for loop. So the first one's just going to be for the number of arms. The second one is going to be very similar to the other for loop that we were doing, but instead of doing a new vector three with a bunch of Gaussians as the X, Y, and Z values, we're going to just call that spiral function with the Gaussians as the X, Y, and Z values. We're also going to need an offset that's based on which arm we are. So the first arm is going to start at zero, the second arm is going to start at the opposite side. So what is that, pi over two, pi, whatever the, uh, I, I don't know my radians, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, okay, I messed up somewhere. Uh, so the, the 
last part of spiral, this should actually be theta because we want to rotate our coordinates by the theta that we calculated. Okay, hey, this looks great. We've got the spiral arms. But there's a huge contrast between the core and the spiral arms. Uh, and most galaxies actually have like this kind of fuzzy, there's a lot of fuzziness. So we wanna create what I'm gonna call the outer core. So back in our galaxy config, we wanna add the distribution values for the outer core. And then here in main, we can actually just copy this piece of code for the inner core. And let's divide our number of stars by four on all these, so that way we're distributing the amount of stars that we have evenly. And we just wanna update this to represent the values for the outer core. Refresh, you can see we've got more of a blending between the uh, inner core and outer core. And obviously these distributions, you can play around with them. I liked how these ones looked, so that's why I'm using them. But you know, if you don't wanna have a spiral galaxy or maybe you wanna have six arms like the Spore galaxy, or you want it to be an ellipsoid galaxy, you can do all of that stuff with just changing the config. Okay, so now we're gonna do a bit more OOP, or as I like to call it, OOP, and we're going to create a galaxy object to hold all of these stars, and also to hold the other objects that we're going to create in a little bit. So we're gonna create a new galaxy class, we're gonna import three. We wanna make a constructor that kind of initializes the stars when we create the galaxy automatically, and then we wanna create a function inside of here that actually initializes the stars. Then we're going to pass a scene into our galaxy, and then we're actually going to move the part about creating the three objects from the stars out of the generate stars method and into here. The reason why I did that, um, because generate stars returns objects and creating a three object from stars and adding it to the scene is a side effect. And I don't like to have side effects when I return things. Now in main, we wanna go ahead and update the uh, scale function to index or to access the stars array in galaxy. We'll move that into the galaxy later. And then now we just create a new galaxy and add it to the scene. Quick check to see if we broke anything and nope, looks like everything's working. Okay, so our galaxy is missing one last thing. Well, it's actually missing some dark dust clouds as well, but it's missing blue dust. I think it's the hydrogen Dust clouds scatter the light and make it look blue. I don't know what gas is, probably somebody can correct me in the comments, but let's add the blue haze. So back in render config, we're going to create some more constants. These are going to be the maximum size that the haze can be, the minimum size that the haze can be, and how opaque we want the haze to be, because we want the haze to be transparent. The haze object is going to be really, really similar to the star object. It's going to take in a position. It's going to hold a reference to a three object that it creates itself. The main differences are going to be how it updates its scale and also the texture. We're going to use the feathered 60 texture for this. This is a transparent texture that has like decreasing alpha or increasing alpha. Uh, basically, it's going to get more transparent as you go out from the center. Now, the big difference between this sprite material and the star sprite material is that we're going to set depth right and depth test to false on this sprite material. That just means that when it's rendering, it's not going to care which haze is in front of another haze because they're all going to blend together. This is really useful for performance because the haze overlaps a lot and those overlap checks are really expensive. If we don't care about them, then it saves a lot on performance. Also, the reason we can do this is because we're going to be rendering the haze to a separate layer. We don't want to apply bloom to the haze, so we're going to render the haze on the base layer and put the stars with the bloom effect over them. Now, the last thing I want to make note of is that the update scale function is going to be a little bit different from the star, whereas we want the stars to bloom more and get larger as we zoom out. We want the haze to get more transparent as we zoom in, and this is because of the Rayleigh effect we can think of it as like the further distance that light has to travel through medium, the more it's going to get scattered. So the further that has to travel through these dust clouds, the more blue it's going to get and more hazy it's going to be. As we zoom in, the light doesn't have to travel as far, so it imparts less of that color onto it. Okay, so now here back in our galaxy object, we are actually just going to duplicate this generate stars function and make it generate haze. And then instead of creating stars, we're just gonna create haze objects. And now back in main, we wanna update the haze scale as well as the star scale. And I accidentally left this part out, but you're gonna to wanna to add that 250 into the update scale on the haze object. And now we'll see that as we zoom out, it gets more blue and hazier. And as we zoom back in, the clouds start to dissipate. Let's go ahead and move those update scale calls into the galaxy itself, just so that we can keep all of our concerns in the same place. 
And we're also going to consolidate the generate stars and generate haze methods into one method called generate object. The way I'm doing it is it's going to take an anonymous function that generates the star or the haze and it's going to call that and it's up to you to pass in that anonymous function. You can do this however you want using like generics or um, like a factory or whatever, uh, you know, whatever you want. We also want to come to galaxy config and create a new constant called haze ratio. This is the ratio of haze to stars. We don't necessarily need it to be one to one since the haze is a lot larger than the stars and we can make our rendering a lot cheaper by just rendering as little haze as we need. Yeah, at this point we are basically done. You can play around the, with the parameters, make it more hazy or less hazy uh, like this. Oop. And uh, I actually found a bug. If you start scrolling before the galaxy loads in, the haze won't get more opaque. It'll stay, or it won't get more transparent. It'll stay like that. So now I'm just gonna talk about the render pipeline a little bit and explain how it works. So I mentioned earlier that the stars are rendered on a separate layer. Uh, the, that layer has bloom applied to it. So that way only the stars have bloom and they look like they're the only ones that glow. So that shader is what compiles all the different layers together. So when we remove that, we see that there's no stars, there's just haze. And if we leave that part in and we remove the base texture, then we'll see that the haze disappears and we're left with only stars. So here in our init render pipeline method or function, whatever you want to call it, um, we create our renderer and then we have these different composers. Each one of these chains together different effects and whatnot. So then here, once those actual composers are created, we switch the camera to render a certain layer and we render it with that composer. For the bloom layer, we render that to a texture. For the base layer, we actually render that to the screen and then we use a shader to take the texture that we rendered our bloom layer to and add them together. So the camera is actually re-rendering the scene multiple different times uh, with different objects in the scene each time and then combining them later with a shader in one of the post-processing stages. And that overlay layer is something that I used for my project to draw those little spheres of influence that you see on the map. It's been a while since I made a tutorial, so I hope that this one was good and easy to follow. All the code is up on GitHub. If you get stuck, you can reference the final code. Uh, if you enjoyed this tutorial, please subscribe. I'd really appreciate it if you guys would check out my game, AI Arena. You can go visit it at AIarena.com. It's in its really, really early stages of development right now, and I need feedback so I can know how to tweak it and make it better. So I'd really appreciate that. All right, thanks, peace.